Hi everyone. Uh, just recently I was invited to uh, share some of my learnings and insights from uh, building Hotel Quickly. It was the closed group. We recorded it, but uh, it's it's accessible only for, for this private uh, private group. So um, yeah, I take it as an opportunity to share some of these insights with you in this uh, separate uh, standalone uh, presentation. So let me just go through some of these slides quickly. I will highlight some of the learnings and, uh, and failures. I hope uh, you, you will enjoy it and learn something uh, from, from this. Just uh, very briefly, uh, let me cover my experience. So I spent uh, nine years uh, in Czech Republic. I have technical background. I co-founded BookFan, a social network startup. We, we raised some funds for this one, but eventually had to close it. Uh, we were not able to monetize it. Then I moved to Thailand, where for five years uh, with my co-founders, we were building Hotel Quickly. So I was responsible for the technical part. I was a CTO. It was, it was lots of fun. Um, we, we raised about $10 million. Now the company uh, has about uh, $100 million uh, in, in revenue yearly. So um, this is this is what it looked like um, when when we built the product um, for iOS and Android applications. Um, it was a last minute hotel booking app. Um, we started focusing on the, the last minute bookers, for example, business people who traveled from uh, Singapore to Hong Kong for a business meeting. Then they had to stay overnight, and they just uh, opened the app, found uh, a few few hotels uh, nearby, and booked uh, really quickly. Uh, the team grew to uh, 90, 95 people uh, during a, a peak time. And then we actually slimmed down to about, um, uh, I would say, 50 people. We focused on profitability. Well, I would say that um, the, one of the takeaways is uh, a favorite quote of, uh, of uh, our CEO, uh, Thomas Labovica, who says that smooth seas do not make uh, skillful sailors, right? And uh, I can I can totally uh, agree and uh, sign with this one because with Hot Quickly it was totally totally crazy right um, and uh, I would say whatever uh, could go wrong it just went wrong we had uh, lots of lots of problems uh, uh, for example uh, we lacked customer understanding we didn't really have a, a strong product market fit uh, our board of advisors um, wasn't really really uh, say um, great. Uh, we were not able to, uh, to to innovate really quickly, and I, I could I could continue with all these issues. But at the same time, it was an opportunity to grow. It was an opportunity to to learn and adapt. And this is something I'm I'm super passionate about. So I like to start with a blank sheet of paper, and then and they say, okay, now we as a team need to improve this part of the business. So let's figure out how other companies do it, and let's do it uh, twice twice as better. Um, unfortunately. Uh, as, as, I'm, as I'm mentioning it, um, one of the issues we struggled with uh, in the company and also uh, me personally was uh, burnout. So, so this is a topic uh, that is not, not very, um, say, uh, pleasurable, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I guess, part of life. Uh, you, you, I'm sure you know what, what a burnout is, but let, let just, um, let's just define it because I, I really like the combination of these two definitions. So it's a state of physical, emotional and mental exhaustion. Um, and then at the same time, it, it's caused because you or the company or, or, or the case uh, that, that you try to push fail to produce the expected reward. And this is something we were going through at Hotel Quickly. So uh, we, we built a business, it was, it was all great from, from one angle, but at the same time, it didn't really meet our expectations, the personal, the business expectations. And uh, yeah, so on, on the flip side, uh, it actually um, taught me how to spot um, spot burnout among employees and suddenly I was like oh god like this person is also burned out and this person also so um, so I learned how to recognize uh, that the symptoms uh, and, and how to spot them so for example having low energy a low interest at work being irritated easily pulling away emotionally from colleagues or clients like these, these are the things that um, are relatively easy to spot but at some point you need to like for example, we, we went through a list of employees and say, oh, you know, this, this person may be burned out, so let's do something about it. One of the other takeaways um, is focused on the invisible assets. So actually at some point I found this very good book, um, 24 Assets, um, which, uh, which describes what kind of assets a company should uh, strive to build. And uh, they, they structure it nicely. Um, for example, uh, you, uh, you should... Uh, create different products in your company, uh, one 
or, or more to offer for free as a gift than to have uh, some products for prospects than to have core um, core products and then products for clients then uh, you should for example well this this guide describes um, how to how to even think about these invisible assets so these assets are not something you you have in uh, say in, in your balance sheet but these are all these uh, standard operating guides this is your knowledge base these are you know the, the documents all the documentation technical or, or process documentation so uh, so this is a very good framework which eventually helped us to um, to, to to change our minds and how we think about it about uh, um, the assets I would say I would say um, now in hindsight I see how could we have um, uh, how could we have be more responsible in, in in maintaining or creating some of these uh, assets like for example I see that over time uh, in the first three years we were building a lot of these uh, assets standard operating procedures lots of documentation and then at some point um, at, at some point the quality started uh, to deteriorate which which really sucks uh, as you know from the company standpoint the company was losing these assets uh, maybe because uh, there was no one really responsible for it or or we just uh, you know at some point uh, really really burned out uh, one of the great examples of these uh, invisible assets is a recruiting video which uh, I created it was already three years ago and it had amazing ROI just because I spent uh, only two three days recording it uh, a few hours with post-production and then we were using this video um, during during all the recruiting um, recruiting processes it was a part of uh, all the workflows it was uh, it was really great we, we uh, got uh, very very positive feedback and um, another uh, example of uh, such an invisible asset could be uh, the Netflix um, uh, culture guide which is a which is a PDF um, presentation which they a few years ago published and uh, ever since it was mentioned so many times uh, so many people refer to it it became a guide for other companies so this is this is something um, that they just put somewhere on on their internet and it became a huge asset for them as a company speaking of recruiting we also um, uh, struggled with uh, with recruiting and hiring talents uh, in uh, in Thailand. So we actually shifted from from this hiring mindset uh, to to HR marketing and sales, into a large extent. So with the local dev market in Thailand, I personally, as a CTO, was a little disappointed. Uh, the the quality of local devs was not really going through the roof. So at some point, we started. Um, um, importing developers from UK, from uh, Belarus, from uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, even from New Zealand, from Australia. We had developers from all over the world. We focused a lot on, on employer branding uh, also to attract these talents. Um, so, so this is uh, the, the concept of HR marketing and sales. Um, the goal was to, um, was to automate as much of the workflow as, as possible so that we can focus on the outbound uh, recruiting while with the inbound it means you know all the applicants that you receive uh, through job boards uh, which didn't really work the quality was uh, substandard um, and instead we focus on outbound recruiting which is um, which is um, you know reach out on LinkedIn mostly with this I'm actually doing also some consulting uh, so um, yeah uh, this is something I do, I do for a few companies and we also build an upskilling platform as a part of our EdTech lab, which is, which is uh, connected to this uh, upskilling of HR teams. We have also uh, team challenges, right? Like, uh, who doesn't have team challenges? Uh, one of one of very um, strange challenge was uh, the developers were too passionate about personal growth. And this comes to um, hiring people like you are, where where at some point we just didn't have a developer to work on some boring project like uh, you know we need to fix uh, this or that and um, yeah the developers just rejected because like oh no this is too boring I don't want to want work on this project it's just you know boring shit so uh, so um, yeah at some point we had to change our hiring strategy and focus on hiring people who, who were diverse and I'll talk about this also later um, we we I struggle with management diversity uh, you, you can imagine five uh, co-founders male Europeans uh, it's not a very diverse team we also like the industry knowledge and uh, thinking of uh, the team ability diversity 
uh, we we then split actually the, um, the the values, abilities, and skills to 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 this kind of framework where values are sort of obviously the most important, and then skills um, eventually least important. Like skills are, for example, um, iOS development or Android development. Um, so so the skills became less less and less important. At some point, we even hired say. Um, um, Blackberry developer who was retrained to, to iOS developer. So the skill itself uh, didn't matter much, but the values and abilities were much more important. And uh, that, uh, that brought us to, to think about values in, in a uniformity way, so that we hire people who have the same values, the same core values as, uh, as the management team, as the company, um, but at the same time have diverse um, abilities. Like for example, I'm a, the, the kind of person who likes to start projects from scratch, but um, at some point there were too many people like me in the company uh, and then there was no one to really finish the projects. So, so that's, that's how we shifted and, uh, and changed the recruiting process. Um, we also um, um, uh, talked quite a lot about the helpful hierarchy, which is uh, just a simple question. How helpful are you on this scale from one to five? And uh, the theme at helpful.com came with, uh, with this pyramid. It's, it's really great. We did a presentation, then we were mentioning it a few times, and it helped to change the mindset of the teammates, where uh, before uh, they, they complained, they just came with some, uh, some ideas here and there, but it was not very helpful. But after this, uh, they, they suddenly shifted. So how it works is uh, that you just communicate. Level one is uh, when you just tell, like, hey, boss, there is a problem. And then you know how helpful it is. It's not really helpful. And then on a level two, you tell your boss you found a problem and then you investigate some causes. It's more helpful, but it's still not really um, helping too much. And then you know you progress. While on the level five, you just say hey, like, hey, I identify the problem. I figured out what it caused it. I researched how to fix it. And then I fixed it. You know, I just wanted to keep you in the loop. And this is really, really helpful. So after we communicated it, um, people, people even on Slack sometimes uh, you know, you could, you could just see on Slack how they wrote some sentence, like, oh gosh, like, this doesn't work again. And then you could see how they edited it, saying, like, hey, gosh, you know, this doesn't work, and I already checked why, and here is, here is why. And so we were able to, to, to engage the team much more with this super simple um, pyramid. We had also um, uh, issues with, uh, with culture. Um, you can imagine that uh, our, our team of Europeans uh, setting up a company in uh, in Asia in Thailand was uh, was uh, you know facing a lot of challenges, and uh, one of those was uh, our family versus high performing team. While at the beginning we created this family like culture, where we created I would say maybe too inclusive uh, environment, which lacked the right level of performance management uh, eventually. So um, somewhere like I would say three years down the road we we realized that maybe we are just way too kind and then we, we shifted it. We tried to shift it uh, to change from the family to high performing team. And uh, that was the time where we focused more on KPIs, we focused more on performance management. It uh, actually also followed some of the Netflix uh, guides and um, eventually it was, it was working very well. Thinking about metrics and KPIs, um, we had we had one very interesting fail, which was the, the BI concierge uh, concept that we introduced. At some point, we had about uh, eight people in the BI team, which is quite crazy if you really think about it. Uh, in a company of uh, say maybe back then it was 60, 70 people, uh, eight of them working in the BI team producing uh, reports is it's really crazy. So the senior team, uh, sales team, marketing team, even management team was not able to work with data which for me as a technical person who can just you know pull data from database, create charts, whatever, it's, it's really not understandable. And uh, with this, with this um, I say, realization, we realize we need to change how the team works with data. So we, we drop this concept of the concierge who brings data on the golden plate and we shifted it to like, hey, there are data somewhere in database, you are responsible for pulling some, uh, some insights and knowledge. And then we organized um, data meetings where each of the of the teammates was supposed to come and, and you know come up with some insights from his or her area of responsibility. It took a few a few meetings, maybe 
I don't know, two or three months, and then you started seeing some of the some of the uh, shifts in their mindset. Like, oh gosh, like you know, now I, I I need to log in somewhere, so give me password. You know, it, for some people, it was the first time they worked with uh, with data. It was also the time where we shifted from the family to performance management. Uh, and uh, this concept uh, helped us a lot. So it's VM, DRP, OKR, WRM. While, uh, you know, VM stands for visual management, DRP stands for directly responsible person, objectives, key results, and then a simple question, what's important right now? So with visual management, like obviously we had, um, we had everything in uh, Jira, we used uh, Kanban board, we experimented with Scrum for some teams, but, um, you know, so it didn't really work. So we... We, we got a coach, agile coach, who scored different teams and we realized that we actually need visual management, like a proper visual management. Like you, you could say even this old school list of projects where uh, we had these priorities um, on the wall. We, we then organized um, performance management meetings, which were meetings where we had uh, a lot of post-its, we had the uh, here you can see on the left we had uh, the KPI map and then we had this, uh, this board which served for the performance management meeting. On the list of projects you can see the link to OKRs. OKRs is uh, the objectives and key results. DR DRP stands for directly responsible person for the project. And um, yeah, overall you could just see that we are pushing everyone to get shit done as you can see on top of it. Um, what's important right now was a simple question we were asking eventually because at some point where we were scaling from 20 people to 50 to 80 like people didn't really know what what is important right now like there are so many problems what should we focus on so we we started um, communicating hey what's important right now it's to fix whatever yeah zumata or taxes and fees calculation and then every week it was something different and uh, we communicated to the team like now this is the most important thing. We also um, implemented team standards. You may know from, from Google's project Aristotle that the group norms are the key to high performing teams. So we got the team to, to create or produce their own standards. You can on one hand impose as a, as a say, CEO or a manager, but it doesn't really work uh, unless the team really defines the standards. So we define the standards such as we value each other's time, so we start meetings on time. Or the second one, if you are expected to join but cannot, you should find a deputy and brief him or her. And these became standards and everyone started suddenly following it. We visualized the KPIs on the wall because previously, like, not many people really, really knew what the KPIs, KPIs are, what, what are the numbers, what are the thresholds. But as soon as it was visualized on a map, um, it, it, started, it started working. People were even sometimes uh, stopping by and, and just looking at the numbers, like even multiple times per day, which didn't really happen while well, it was somewhere deep in, in Confluence or in some uh, BI tool or that no one really uh, looked into. On the KPI, um, on the KPI map, we visualized some of the thresholds, like you can see green and red post-its. It was, it was very helpful when, uh, when some of the um, KPI thresholds were out of uh, some, some bounds, boundaries. And then with visual management, we had this, uh, this uh, board where we had uh, KPI highlights. Every week, one person was responsible to, to pick the, uh, the numbers and, uh, and copy-paste. So it actually helped the person to really you know, feel, feel the numbers from inside because if you need to write the numbers, then you need to think about it. It's completely different than, you know, when some BA concierge just, you know, sends you PDF and then it's uh, lost somewhere in the email. So we had uh, this, this wall with um, experiment of the week, with next steps, with the biggest problems, uh, what, to, what to celebrate, team successes. And this was, this was really helping to make the performance management meetings fast and like, like tack, 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 tack. It previously, uh, a performance management or a weekly meeting took us maybe you know one and a half hours because of discussions because you know the some of the ex extroverted guys were just talking uh, endlessly and now with this new framework in place it was like tack 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 we also uh, spent quite a lot of time uh, focusing on leadership like how to become better leaders uh, our teams were growing 
And one, one of the concepts helped us a lot, which is the ex extreme ownership. We had problems with, uh, with, with blaming each other uh, in the company. Uh, so, for example, uh, marketing was blaming IT and then sales was blaming marketing and marketing was blaming, you know, customer service or, you know, things like this. Uh, so so we, we've learned about this uh, concept, extreme ownership, where it's, it's super simple. It's pretty much just like own everything in your world and blame no one else. It, this is the simple concept. Now I just told you uh, the, the content of the 200 page uh, book, but still it's good to read it. I, I highly recommend because then you really feel it and it, it uh, forces you to think about it and hopefully ingrain in, in your behavior. So uh, I strongly recommend extreme ownership. And with cultural challenges, obviously you can imagine that five guys uh, coming from Europe to Asia to, to Thailand to set up a company and then hire uh, 50, 50 Thais uh, could bring lots of uh, cultural challenges. And um, some of those challenges were, for example, related to humor. Like uh, you may know that uh, now here in, in Slovakia, Czech Republic, uh, sarcasm, irony, cynicism is, is very, say, common. Um, but it's... Uh, not very well understood in uh, in Thailand in Asia, and uh, it also uh, undermined the performance of our management team. I would say, with handshake, it was uh, it was very um, weird. I would say in, in some cases, because uh, you know that um, Thais don't sh uh, shake hands, right? But um, what what was actually awkward is that we know they don't shake hands, but uh, they know that we Europeans do shake hands. So now it actually created all these weird situations where someone came for a meeting and uh, during during the meeting uh, the person knew that we, you know, he is supposed to or how to say it, he uh, on one hand he doesn't shake hands so he doesn't really know how to you know properly shake hands, you know, how to have a firm handshake um, but on the other hand, he wants to do it because he feels like he should. Yeah, so so it was completely awkward, and then they were like, you know, ah, no, 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 not really good. We had uh, issues with idea generation uh, because um, you know quite a lot of Asians are are, and especially developers are introverts. Uh, they uh, frequently just uh, you know look up to to Europeans um, with with respect. Um, which um, which is good on one hand, but on the other hand, it prevents uh, brainstorming uh, to to function well. It prevents idea generation. So uh, the the way we overcame it was uh, with uh, with for example anonymous ask me anything form on Google form. We had um, brainstormings in a Google Sheet where where guys could just uh, sit behind the, their desk and um, brainstorm um, um, quietly. Um, with with English, another problem, um, it, it's often an issue to have a mental block where um, Asians sometimes, you know, they, they cannot speak in front of a large group, especially in English, um, trouble with accent fluency, and uh, due to us uh, not, not speaking English, we were unable to penetrate the local crowd. So um, my wife, for example, she speaks English, but uh, I, I didn't, uh, she speaks Thai. But I didn't uh, learn to speak Thai, unfortunately. Well, I focused on on, on other things. Um, so we were unable to lo to penetrate the, the proper, you know, hardcore crowd. Who sometimes, you know, the developers are very good. They just don't speak English, and we couldn't uh, talk to them. So we we were not even hiring those who cannot speak English. So uh, a lot of lot of cultural challenges, lots of different, um, lots of uh, differences. Lots of uh, problems that I could, I could just continue and go on, go on, because uh, there are so many things we've tried and we experimented with. But um, yeah, I, I guess I just stop it here. If you have some questions, just follow me and uh, drop me a message. Uh, there is a form on my website, so you can just follow that one and uh, let's keep in touch.